All right, hey, we're going to get started. I'm going to pray. We got to get into it. John chapter 6, what a beautiful chapter today. Really looking forward to reading it with you guys and uh, unpacking all the different things. Let's pray. God, um, man, we, we just want to thank you for being a great, great, great God. And Lord, as, as we look to you as our, as our King and our Savior, Lord, we understand just the magnitude of who you are and your greatness, Lord, and just how just epic you are in, in the way that you can hold these things together, in the way that you created, in the way that you love us. Lord, I want to pray that as we continue to look at Jesus' life in John chapter 6 here, Lord, that we might um, hear your words, that they might fill us, Lord, like, like the bread of life that you are. Lord, and I just want to ask that your spirit might move through our hearts and our minds today in this, in this time of studying your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. We had an interesting question last week that I went back and dug up some research this probably won't be on the quiz. Um, don't feel like you have to take it all down. But the question was, was there other resurrection um, that happened with people in the Old Testament? And so I went ahead and documented all 10 of the people that the Bible says that went from death to life physically. So we have Elijah healing the widow's son, I think. Um, you brought that one up. We have Elisha doing something very similar to another son. Interesting, the boy sneezed seven times <laughs> and then came back to life. Who knows what that's all about. Um, now we have this really interesting one. An Israelite man was put into a tomb. He was dead. He accidentally touched Elisha's bones and he came back to life. So that's a thing that the Bible talks about. <laughs> Those are the three in the Old Testament. And then we have Jesus doing a healing. Touches the casket and tells the young man to get up, and he does. Then we have Jesus healing Jairus' daughter. And when I say heals here, I mean brings back to life. <laughs> um, Jesus heals Lazarus. Jesus, the most famous one that we all remember. Then um, there was the saints of Jerusalem. Someone brought this up after the resurrection that there was random people walking around in Jerusalem after that <laughs> death and resurrection. Wasn't there a resurrection actually when Jesus died? That's, that's the one we're talking about here, yeah. Then um, Peter healed. It's the same person, two different names, Tabitha or Dorcas. And then the poor boy that fell out the window while Paul was teaching late into the night and got healed there as well. So, 10 different accounts of coming back to life from death. It was an interesting little study. I appreciate you guys asking that question and getting into it. Pop quiz, no pop quiz today because I owed you guys way too much candy. I'm losing all my money giving my candy away to you guys. Um, hey, this morning I want to read... Um, John chapter 6 together, and I want you to be prepared with something that's jumping off the page. I'm going to read the whole chapter for us this morning. Um, you can choose to kind of close your eyes and just try to play it out or think about all the Christians in the past that have not been able to read and write and how they would interact with the Word of God um, coming through. Or you can follow along on your Bible if you'd like to. I'm going to read out of the ESV. Whatever you kind of like to do, but please do keep um, in your mind something that is sticking out to you from the chapter because I'm going to call on certain people to answer what's going on here. Hey, there's a lot of good stuff here. I'm looking forward to diving into it. Are we ready? All right. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd is following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Lamb, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread, so that these people may eat? And he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. 
One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. See also the fish as much as they wanted. And when they had entered, or when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. And when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because of a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. And then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at land to which they were going. On the next day, the crowds that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but the food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. When they said, or then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe in him who is sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. It is as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, who father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will be all, or they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes have, has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. 
If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. For whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself the disciples were grumbling about this, said to him, Do you take offense to this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon, Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Quite a roller coaster going on here in this passage. I want to hear, Zach, let's start with you. What's something that popped out at you? Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting how the it was set up. Jesus would say something, they would say something, he'd respond. It was a lot of back and forth, yeah. Let's go, Brett. What uh, stuck out to you? Well, it kind of just started to make me think in John six, verse forty four, it says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. Sixty-five as well. Yep. So, I, I appreciate that because it definitely speaks to this idea of predestination, right? Um, I had this college professor in my undergrad. He was brilliant. Had been a college professor at my school for like forty-five years, right? He was old. He had this bromance going on with this other old dude. They would just like make fun of each other. They were just super good vibes, and, but just brilliant people too that would come. And, and I'll never forget the day when I'm in theology one or two and I'm sitting down and I'm like, oh my gosh, today he promised he was going to give us an answer about predestination and free will and how it all works together. And I'm just waiting because this guy's brilliant, and I just know he's going to come up with the answer that none of us could come up with because we have been bantering back and forth all over the place. And he just says, I don't know how they work together, but they do. And I'm like, thanks a lot, Dr. Husted. <laughs> that was really kind of you. But it is true. There is absolutely God first choosing people. There is absolutely 
people choosing God. There is absolutely an opportunity that begins with the one who is alive, which is God, while we are dead to our sins and trespasses. Christians cannot start the relationship with God. God always makes the first move. Okay? Always has, always will. That being said, I, I don't understand how it all works. <laughs> because I, I do, in the classic Calvinism tulip, which talks about the course of kind of this reformed predestination theology, I like a lot of it. The one I have wrestling with is the idea of irresistible grace. I'm not convinced that a human being can hear God's grace and have no option but respond and be chosen. I think people will hear the gospel and that they'll have an option that's not just predestined to them, but that they'll have an option to say yes or no. And that's where I fall on that scale. Um, but I do know I'm really grateful I was chosen. <laughs> You know, even though I responded to God, I am so grateful that he made the first move. And I think predestination makes me, makes me feel really special <laughs> that God would choose me first. So that's where I land with that. I don't know how it all works. Um, it's like oil and water. Yes. I, right, right. I think they were more concerned that they were going to fake a resurrection mm -hmm. okay. because Jesus had alluded a few times publicly that he was coming back from the dead. Um, but to your point, one of the things that Christians were persecuted for even in the first 150 years of the church was that they were cannibals because they talked about it all the time. I. I, I don't think that that was maybe primary. It might have been a secondary reason that they had guards as they were concerned about it. But let's get back to highlights. Highlights that were brought. Yes, in the back. Um, so I highlighted the same verse as Brett, but when I read it, I kind of got um, like it was the father's choice that hmm. I Good question. Um, to the verse 45, I think, I think part of it is Jesus claiming to be God there and that God is there physically teaching. Um, I, I think also the prophets of the Old Testament, you know, obviously there was people that were dead that didn't get to see Jesus or people that were unborn didn't get to see Jesus. But the fact that all of Christianity, and I believe Judaism too, all rests on Jesus, that his teaching, even if it was to come in the future, was also prevalent throughout history, if that makes sense. Um, let me explain that. If we, if we take away space and time, right, the blood of Jesus is what saved Old Testament heroes. The blood of Jesus is what saves us today. Um, and so it's, it's this teaching of God in the flesh that speaks to everyone. That, that's where I would go with that verse. There's probably books upon books that are written about it with other theories and ideas. Yeah? 38, you say, for I come down from heaven, um, and I do not do my will, but my Father's will. Do they have different wills? 
Well, if we, if we think about Jesus in the garden begging for the cup to be passed, right? Jesus is saying, hey, I don't want to go to the cross. Like, I really don't want to do this. Interesting that Jesus can be perfect and be wrestling with God, right? Interesting that Jesus can have that conversation with God. Do they have different wills? That's up, that's up for debate. You know, Jesus wasn't um, tainted by sin, right? So part of us having a different will from God will have to do with sin being a part of our lives, you know? Um, but interesting that even in a perfect form that Jesus was wrestling. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. It's it and it's the wrestling that makes him so much more, you know, when scripture says that he faced every trial of every kind and yet was without sin, that makes it so much more relatable to us as humans <laughs> to see him wrestling or hungry or whatever else it might be, tired, needing alone time. You know, we see all these very human characteristics of Jesus. Well, and, and even bigger than that, what it's referring to is authority within the relationship of the Trinity, right? Where, where they're just aligned, you know? And if they can't exist without one another, do they, do they really have authority over one another? You know, it's just how it's set up, and, and Jesus is setting that example for humans, too, of when your will doesn't align with God's, you know what I'm saying? So then can the cup be passed if he asked? Apparently not, because he went through with it. Yeah? So questioning God's will is a wrestle. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a blanket statement. Um, I believe that you can be disobedient by not doing something but I think also wrestling with God is very appropriate can you be disobedient misinterpreting something <laughs> I mean I, I just can't answer that question blanket that's a very all I can say is we do our best to find God's will. We do our best to obey it. When we don't obey it, it's, it's disobedience. Um, but I, I, I just see over and over through the scriptures of holy people that wrestle with God. We have Jacob who physically wrestled with the angel, right? Popped his hip out, said, I'm not going to let go until you give me a blessing. Um, you have Moses and Abraham both bartering with God about not destroying people, but wanting things. You know, you have all these different situations where there's wrestling back and forth. Even like the prophet Elijah saying, God, just kill me. Kill me now. I can't handle it. And they're like arguing <laughs> together, you know. Um, and Jesus, you know, asking for these things and yet coming under the will of God. And I think it's much more appropriate as humans to wrestle with God than to not care. So I would just say if, if, if you're wrestling with God's will, do your best. <laughs> and keep moving. And he, will watch, he, he cares about the heart, right? He cares about the heart. Yeah. Yes. And so I was just a little curious, like, would it be better if he was, they were following him because of the signs, in a sense, or? 
Well, we have to remember the thesis of the book of John, right? Which says, and this does not account for all of the signs, but they were done that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and in him is life, right? My gosh, how many times did life pop up here, right? And signs and these different things. He's really sticking with the thesis of what he's doing here. Um, it's interesting to me that the same people that just saw this feeding of the 5,000 say, what sign do you have to give us? It's like, it's like didn't, we, didn't we just get like the craziest thing ever happen? Um, but what, what people are doing similar to the woman at the well is that they are wanting the physical rather than the spiritual. They want the easy button Jesus. They want their bellies to be filled. You know, the woman at the well says also, give me the living water so that I don't have to come to the well anymore. <laughs> so I don't have to come draw water to drink. People are too easily satisfied with the physical things. They want God to be a genie to make their life easier. And what Jesus is saying here is he's like, hey, you know, in 27, don't work for the food that perishes, but work for the food that endures to eternal life that the Son of Man will give to you, right? Um, Jesus is saying, you're asking the wrong questions. You're looking for the wrong things. <laughs> Rather than just the physical, you got to look to the deeper level here. Yeah, but it also says that Joseph covered it rather than exposing her to the shame, right? I bet you the whole town believed that they slept together early. And I bet you Joseph's reputation took a hit because of it. And Mary's, for that matter. So I don't, I don't know if they would have been privy to the information of... Joseph being like, I'm not sure if I'm marrying this chick because she's pregnant and we did not, <laughs> you know. in Matthew as well. It also leaves out the, um, in Matthew, right before Jesus feeds the 5,000, he learns of the news that John the Baptist had been beheaded. Um, leaves that out as well. Um, I don't know. It was, it was up to the author's intent of what he wanted to focus on. I think, I think that John here just me skeptical like making a, a theory up. I think he was trying to drive, like add the story here, but I think his main point was trying to get back to the bread that had come down from heaven um, because that was going to be where a bunch of people were going to leave him. And I think yeah, it was important. Start, the chapter starts with him breaking the bread. Mm -hmm. and and I think he's trying to keep that sandwich a little closer maybe. Magic. I've never noticed that before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Also, another thing that I have is well. I noticed verse 48 includes like six words. I am the bread of life. Do you know if there's like a significance behind that? Yes. And that's in my slides. Great segue, Maddie. We're going to get into the slides. Um, so just remember, we're up here. 
So the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum's right up here on the top. We're on the other side of Capernaum, somewhere around in here for the feeding of the 5,000, kind of back and forth. Interesting here that, that Jesus goes up the mountain. Uh, might this refer to Moses who went up the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments? Um, maybe. But hills, hills were a big deal in the Bible. And when the imagery of the hill and the mountain comes up, you know, there's a lot of things that happen on the high places with God. Um, Now, 5,000 men, you know, we have to be aware that there's women and children there as well. So there might have been more than 5,000 people in there, which is interesting. Here, I'll, I can move out of your guys' way a little bit. I always find it interesting that in the midst of being asked, um, asked how they're going to find all the money for this, that Andrew brings a boy that brought up a lunch with him. I think it's cool. Maybe I romanticize it a little bit, but I like that Andrew at least goes, has an idea. <laughs> goes to Jesus like, I'm not sure what you're going to do with this, but this is something. It almost seems like a teamwork kind of thing to me. Jesus gives a prayer. He gives thanks for the food. It's different than blessing the food. Jesus is looking to God and saying, thank you for this. Um, which, there's a bit of differentiation there, but not anything too crazy. And then he gathers 12 baskets of fragments, just in case we didn't believe that something miraculous here <laughs> happened. <laughs> we have more than we even started with. Yes? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I could imagine if it was my lunch, my life would be severely different walking away from that. Um, obviously, it's just speculation because we don't, we don't have any historical record of it. But yeah, talk about God multiplying what we bring to the table, yeah? And I found this verse 15 to be really interesting. Jesus, and this is a quote, perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. <laughs> Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. What a stark contrast to where we get at the end of the chapter where there's only 12 disciples left. <laughs> we go from being worried that we're going to be forced into kingship to left by ourselves. It says something about church and ministry as well. A lot of churches and ministries, they want their numbers to get big. They want to have a big movement. A lot of that comes from good motivation of just wanting to see a lot of people be saved and have real things happen with the Lord. Um, but Jesus in his perfect ministry drove off when he got at the peak of the fever pitch of popularity he said you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood and people are like what the heck I'm out honestly I don't know if I blame the people that much that's a wild thing to say um but I do think that there's something to it where Jesus was not that concerned about how big his following grew. He was more concerned about the truth and the things that he was saying, and he was more concerned about being accurate and challenging than he was about being the king of the nation at that moment. He had a bigger plan in mind. And I think that's something to keep in mind as we work in ministries, as we work in churches, and you have a part is like, what's the goal? 
You know, if, if Jesus was okay losing a multitude of followers, what's the goal? Moves over to Jesus walking on water. We have some things three to four miles, and the sea is getting crazy. Jesus gets in, and the boat immediately lands at the destination. Something special happened there. I, I can't explain it. And like you guys brought up, Matthew 14, it accounts for more than just uh, what was done there. It's an interesting story. You know, people speculate that all kinds of things to try to explain how Jesus was walking on the water. And really with scripture, you just got to read it and hear it and just let it be, (laughs) let it be something that's special. I know you guys hate it when I do this, but we're going to the next slide. People find Jesus again. What are they doing for? They're looking for food that perishes. They go on to say, give us this bread of living water. It's interesting how God sets up punchlines through the Old Testament. I, I, I just have this feeling that as God put the first manna out in the wilderness for the people of Israel, that he's like, oh, just wait until you see Jesus come in and fulfill this one. The the way that God told the redemption story and presents his gospel to us is absolutely intricate and beautiful. And the way in which it works with the history of of Israel. Like, here's the deal, guys. There is no way, in my opinion, my humble opinion here, there is no way some person made this Christianity thing up. It's too complex. It's too detailed. It's too beautiful. The fact that Jesus here is talking about something that happened thousands of years prior and is connecting it. It just shows God's fingerprints through history. This is a well-designed redemption plan that is just the most, like, I I can't even get over how many little things had to fit together for it to hold water. And you're going to tell me that a bunch of fishermen, uneducated, made this thing up? Yeah, right. Right. I am the bread of life. So there's a bunch of I am statements here Jesus is going to make in the book of John. This is kind of a book of John signature thing. I wanted to pull out the Greek for you guys. And then this is the Greek spelled out with English terms. And then obviously the English there. The different statements are, I am the light of the world, I am the gate, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am the true vine. And then he says another thing, which I added in here. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, which is a crazy claim. And I believe that this is connected along with many other scholars that I've read, that the I am is deeply connected with the name of Yahweh, where Moses is at the burning bush and asks, who do I say sent me to Pharaoh? God says, I am. And um, again, we talked about the claims of Jesus and how important it is to take them seriously, you know, to hear that either this guy was an absolute liar after, or a lunatic, he was just crazy and out of his mind, or he was telling the truth, and it really cannot be anything else. (laughs) Can't just be a good teacher. We'll get into the I am statements, but to say the bread of life, life, you know, connects with our thesis of the book of John. Bread connecting us to not just the feeding of the 5,000, not just um, that, but also the manna in the wilderness. 
think about, too, the temptation of Jesus. Man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the Father's mouth. Jesus being the mouth of God, representing. We got people leaving Jesus. This is a Greek word that we talked about in the second lecture, logos, which is the word. Logos comes from this idea of the word that separates truth from lie, the ultimate thing going on here. People say this is a hard teaching, and the Greek word for hard or teaching there is logos, which I find interesting. But Jesus is compared with that word, and now they're saying this is a hard teaching. And it is. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And, uh, you know, this is talking about communion. That is to come in the Last Supper. This is talking about Jesus and totally relating with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. I think it's funny that chapter 6, verse 66 is when people are turning their back. (laughs) 666. I just found that that ironic. (laughs) Then I love Jesus' question, do you want to leave as well? And Peter, who for better or for worse is going to speak up, (laughs) he's going to say something, says something absolutely beautiful. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Man, this speaks directly like Peter was actually listening to Jesus saying, I'm the bread of life. He says, you have the words of eternal life. Jesus is talking about raising those whom the Father gives him on the last day, and then he's talking about eternal life. It's almost like Peter actually heard this one. <laughs> it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. I, I like to think about that verse being a personal thing. That I like to say to God, Lord, to whom shall I go? You have the words of eternal life. Where else am I going to go find <laughs> the things that you offer? Nothing else can satisfy in the way that you do. I think that that verse is really powerful. Yeah? So um, when God talks about the food that perishes, (coughs) yeah. Yeah, I, I, I believe that these are all being set up as analogies just like that, that really we're only satisfied by those things. And there's another verse, and I'm just not, I'm just not pulling it up in my, in my mind right now, that talks about um, just that hunger and thirst being satisfied. <laughs> you know, there's a psalm that says, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longs for you. Um, but if anyone else can think of, there, there's another verse, I'm just not pulling it up in my mind, about those who hunger and thirst will be satisfied. Oh, yeah. the Beatitude. Yes, those who find in their thirst after righteousness, they will be filled. They will be filled. One of the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 would, would be speaking to that as well. Yeah, yeah there's the, there's the found, you know, people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug for themselves a cistern that does not hold water. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I I think that that's a really accurate, really accurate way of thinking about it. Let's see. I think this was my last one. That's my last one. Very cool, guys. Hey, John chapter 6, it's a tricky one. I, uh... Overall, I want you to think about just the ebbs and flows that Jesus went through in this life. 
I think Jesus probably had a hard time watching people walk away. You know, I've, I've in my time here serving as a high school youth pastor, I've seen so many kids walk away. It's so gnarly. It's so hard to watch. I couldn't imagine being Jesus themselves, like himself, watching people walk away. What a mistake to walk away from Jesus. Like, things are just getting good. We're only in chapter 6. You know, there's so many good things to see and hear and, and be a part of, and they missed out on it. Um, I would challenge you, you know, when, when things get tough with the Lord, when he calls us to stretch, are we people that walk? Or are we people that says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Nothing else is going to satisfy. You're the one that I want. Man, I just heard that Grease song in my head. You're the one that I want. You heard that too? I heard that in my own head. Any other thoughts, questions, concerns from you guys on John chapter 6? Yeah. <laughs> what will the questions for the pop quiz be? Yes. I just noticed how, like, in the server, Jesus feeds the 5,000. Um, in verse 12, he says, gather the pieces that are left over and let nothing be wasted. And I was just thinking about, like, how much, like, how little God wastes, I guess, mm. because he's mm. not. Yeah. And it's like anything you dedicate to God, whether you walk the right way or not, it's mm -hmm. giving it to God. Mm -hmm. it to I like that. Yet, when God gives to us, He gives us the cup that runneth over, right? When He feeds the 5,000, there's 12 baskets full left over. It's like He doesn't waste what we give, but He gives us way more than we could ever even handle. You know what I'm saying? The relationship back and forth there, I think, is really beautiful. Cool, guys. I'm going to pray. Dismiss you. Lord, may the words of John 6 ring true in our hearts and minds this week as we go about doing your things. Lord, I want to pray over the hearts in this room. Lord, would we be satisfied by the bread of life? Nothing else. Lord, don't let us turn to the junk food that we want. But let us be satisfied by you and your love, your goodness. We love you, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 All right, you guys are dismissed. Thank you.